Good day, everyone. Here I am going to present some of the issues encountered when creating the MODF of the Sudankula supersite. In particular, I am going to illustrate the spatial heterogeneity of some of the variables measured in the supersite area. The Sudankula supersite consists of several measurement stations distributed over an area of about one square kilometer. Um, observational uh, towers uh, um, near surface devices are located in uh, forest, uh, in uh, open areas, uh, uh, over wetland, and are integrated into observational system that monitors the interaction between the Earth's surface, biosphere, and the atmosphere. The photos in the satellite map illustrate the main observational sites, each of them being constituted by several installations like towers, automatic weather station, sensors in the snow and the soil, etc. For its strategic allocation in an area that represents North Eurasia Taiga and for its comprehensive and multidisciplinary set of measurements, Sodankola Supersite belongs to several atmospheric and cryospheric networks, and it is also a calibration validation site for NASA and ESA uh, satellite missions. For this reason, it is important that Sudankula data becomes as accessible as possible. And through the EOPS site model intercomparison project, we have the opportunity to create files containing data from the EOPS spatial observing periods, which are in spring and summer 2018, in standardized format. Um, previous talk have already introduced the concept of merged observatory data files. Here I will only mention that uh, Sudankula MODF will be created for single level variables as well as vertical profiles based on towers near surface arrays of sensors and also for radio sounding. To illustrate the complexity of the produced Sudankula MODF, I will now show the spatial heterogeneity of some selected variables, which aim to capture the spatial heterogeneity existing in nature in, uh, in the area of a model grid cell. Uh, in this slide is the time series of the soil temperature during 2018 in five locations, uh, with the EOP spatial observing period uh, shaded in gray. Uh, during SOP1, meaning in February, March, uh, the soil did not freeze at the wetland and in the thick forest. Um, in fact, the soil at the forest site is insulated by um, um, a thick layer of lichen, um, which is 10 times thicker than in the surrounding forest, because the measurement area has been fenced for decades, keeping lichen-eating reindeers away. Uh, during SOP2, uh, the, the soil temperature showed uh, a larger diurnal variation um, in uh, uh, sparse forest uh, than in the thick forest, uh, but showed even larger variation uh, in the open fields, in the wetland and in the uh, small open areas. This plot shows the snow depth measurements made at five different sites throughout the season. In this case, it is particularly useful to look also at the period in between uh, SOP1 and SOP2, when snow disappears, to highlight the differences among the sites. The largest snow depth is observed a small open area, this, uh, the upper curves here. Snow is trapped there and disappears last. In the thick forest, the red line, snow depth is smallest because of interception by the canopy, while in the wet wetland, the green line, there is not snow trapping effect and um, because the area is wide um, uh, over uh, two, three kilometers and the near surface wind speed is larger than in the, in the small opening, causing drifting snow and uh, enhanced uh, snow sublimation. As a result, uh, on wetlands, snow depth is smaller than in small open areas. These satellite photos show the approximate size of the instrumented small forest openings. 
these three images have approximately the same scale and the diameter of the opening range from 20 to 50 meters. We look now at the spatial heterogeneity of the 2-3 meter air temperature. This central plot shows the time series of the difference between the 3 meter air temperature at the micrometeorological tower and at other four stations. We see that the 2 meter temperature difference between stations is up to 10 Kelvin and wetland is usually colder than small open areas in the forest. Also, the difference is largest under weak winds and when 3 meter air temperature is around minus 20. Concerning radiative fluxes, there were six stations measuring shortwave radiative fluxes. They are illustrated here in this plot where we see global reflected radiation albedo in an uh, overcast day on the left and in a clear sky day on the right. In the plots, there are also uh, radiative transfer calculations shown by these uh, black and gray lines um, uh, that simulate a clear sky um, um, diurnal cycle uh, in both uh, uh, left and right plots. Uh, these calculations were done for reference to identify issues with the data. One of these issues is the, is the, the position of frost uh, on the domes, as we can see here uh, in MET2. And another issue uh, is calibration of the, of the sensor, as we can see here is an issue in MET5. In MET Without this radiative transfer calculation, it would be very difficult to identify this problem. What we also see is the strike, striking different uh, um, uh, reflected radiation and also global radiation observed uh, at the uh, thick forest side, this gray, uh, green line. Um, also, we see that uh, most of the stations are in shadow. Uh, the shadow are these spikes here, and only on wetland uh, station were not affected by shadows. Also, we see that uh, um, the albedo of the canopy is, is significantly lower than the albedo of uh, open areas, and it ranged from 0.5 to 0.15 during the um, SOP1 period. The incoming and outgoing longwave fluxes were measured only at three stations, in the sounding station, the blue line in the forest, the red lines, and above the canopy, the black lines. Again, on the left is the overcast case, and on the right, the clear sky case. A longwave incoming radiation uh, was much smaller in the open area than in the forest, both in overcast and clear sky condition. In clear sky, it was the, the cooling in the opening was very strong compared to the forest where the surface was uh, um, closer to the thermal equilibrium with the surrounding forest. Considering uh, MET5, so the measurements above the canopy, we can really trust uh, um, the incoming, the measured incoming long wave flux. We suspect a strong interference of the nearby structure. Therefore, to calculate the net radiation above the canopy, we applied the long wave in measured at 16 meters at the sounding station. In this plot here, we have the net radiation measured during the selected overcast and clear days at the three stations. In the legend, the daily mean net fluxes are marked. Uh, in the forest, check 2, and in the opening sounding station, the net radiation is very small and smaller in clear sky than in cloudy sky, meaning positive cloud radiative forcing, which is due to the high albedo of the snow. But above the canopy uh, at uh, MET5, uh, the net radiation is significantly larger than in the other two stations, and is larger in clear sky than in cloudy condition, meaning a negative cloud forcing with dominance of shortwave warming over the longwave cooling. And this is due to the higher, uh, to the lower albedo of the of the canopy. And finally, some take-home messages. 
The first is that comparison of Sodankola supersite observation with model output is not trivial. Extreme attention should be paid to the spatial heterogeneity of the considered variables. Secondly, observations are not necessarily the truth. Be aware of the errors. A guidebook to the error sources and to the data uncertainty of Sodankola and MODF will soon be published. And I want to stress again that Sodankola and ODF will enable easy access to this complex and comprehensive data set. Time series of different data type will be published in different MODF, one for single height variable, one for vertical profiles, and one for radio sounding. And in the near future, also drone-based measurement will be added in the Sodankola data set and possibly will be part of another MODF. Uh, this data will be operational in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention.